What's up, Open Floor Globe? I'm your host, Michael the Pod Pina, and I'm joined on the other line by my good friend, Sports Illustrated senior writer, Chris Herring. Chris, it's so wonderful to see you today. How are you doing, my man? I'm good. It's 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 been a minute. It's good to see you, and um, happy happy to be rolling into the weekend. How are you? I'm also happy to be rolling into the weekend after uh, the week of news that we are going to address at the top of the show. Uh, um, speaking of, in, in today's episode, we are going to touch on yesterday's uh, bombshell story from ESPN's Baxter Holmes about Phoenix Suns owner Robert Sarver. We're going to try to explain why the Philadelphia 76ers are so good. And we are going to open up the mailbag as we usually do. Uh, first, a quick reminder to keep those emails coming in openfloormail at gmail.com. That's openfloormail at gmail.com. Uh, okay, Chris, so. We sadly need to uh, start on a depressing, albeit uh, important story that was published on ESPN yesterday by Baxter Holmes. It's about Robert Sarver and his 17-year reign of alleged terror as owner of the Suns. In this story, which everyone should go read on their own, uh, Baxter spoke to over 70 former and current Suns employees about Sarver's racist language and anti-diversity belief system, his misogynistic views and actions, the way that his behavior negatively impacted the mental health of so many different people who worked and still work for him, how he interacted with them on essentially a subhuman level. Uh, Sarver denied almost all the allegations except for a story about him pantsing former Suns account executive David Botson in August 2014 in front of more than 60 employees at the team's ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. The NBA has responded by outsourcing a law firm to conduct an internal investigation that will then dictate whether any disciplinary measures are appropriate. Uh, That basically... You know, that sums it up. There's a lot of stuff in here um, that you and I are probably going to dig a little bit into right now. But, Chris, just broadly, what was your reaction when you first read and, and saw the story? I mean, there was a pretty amazing amount of detail in the story. And um, while I'm not going to say that one or two details being accurate or that someone copying to one or two of them means that all of them are true i've worked with baxter before he's not he's not just someone that's just running with stuff um so i mean (laughs) and you don't talk to that many people and not have a lot a whole lot of truth in your story and so i mean there were a whole lot of i don't recall that and you know it, it is he said versus he said he said versus she said where with the exception of Earl Watson, you didn't have a whole lot of people on the record saying it. But, I mean, it was pretty horrible, horrible stuff where you've got somebody justifying using the N-word repeatedly. Uh, By the way, there were a lot of N-word allegations in there for none of them to have been true. Um, So, I mean, there was was a whole lot of stuff that just, with so many people and so many anecdotes that were pretty vivid... um, And ones where, quite frankly, I mean, Baxter led the story with Earl Watson. And Earl Watson, I mean, honestly, the way I felt um, reading it is that, you know, you've got a couple of things that people are willing to fire off for stories like these. But this was like, this felt a whole lot, not to bring R. Kelly into stuff, but like the R. Kelly trapped in the closet where there were like 38 editions of the song and iterations of the song there was like 38 of these things in the story it was so much and it literally started to read not that because of how baxter wrote it but like and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened and Mm -hmm. then this happened and in fairness you know to be fair baxter the way you're supposed to do in journalism you lay out the allegation you give them a chance to respond it was like 40 of them in a row where he was like he says that didn't happen and he says that didn't happen and that this didn't happen. It's like it just starts to read as kind of unbelievable from my point of view where just nothing happened. And just all these things are just things that people happen to remember in really vivid detail that were really offended by. You know, they were really offended by. So I, I was kind of mortified by the story. But that said, as I was reading it, the whole thing I kept thinking was, is there enough here to even really change anything? 
And that's kind of the scary part is that I think a lot of owners probably think that way and do that sort of stuff. Um, Sarfer has never really struck me as the person that has the best judgment in the league. Um, Mm -hmm. That criticism has been made by everybody. Um, But the difference between this and Donald Sterling is that so much of the stuff with Donald Sterling was on, you know, we had proof of it having happened by hearing the tape. tape. Unless that exists here. And I mean, you know, this would really be a good, like, speak now or forever hold your peace moment for the people that are saying this stuff. You shouldn't necessarily have to have that sort of proof, but if you have it, it'd be wonderful because, uh, yeah, I, I just don't know how you oust this dude without that. Um, and maybe the league will do that anyway, or maybe they will find all this stuff to have been true. Maybe more people go on the record. I just don't know. I mean, the league really hasn't been challenged with, uh, he said, she said, sort of situation involving an owner with this many allegations. Uh, So I don't know what will happen, but um, I felt like the story was complete. I thought it was fair. I thought it looked silly that the Suns denied it and were calling it, you know, hogwash before they ever saw it. Or or maybe they had gotten his questions by that point. I don't know. Um, But I, you know, it, it was, it was, a little bit worse than I even thought it would be when, when, when you know, the stuff started to leak about the fact that the story was happening. Baxter did a good job. Yeah, I mean, it's a terrific read. Again, everyone should go check it out um, and read the whole thing, please. But I, we should yeah. note that uh, James Jones um, has a statement or had a statement that was released, I believe, in response to... I'm kind of just assuming here, but in response to um, Baxter submitting questions to the Phoenix Suns organization a few weeks back, uh, the CEO of the Suns also released a statement at the time. Both statements were then in the story. Uh, they were pro server statements saying that this doesn't sound like the man that they know. Um, former Suns player Rex Chapman uh, tweeted last night that uh, this doesn't sound like the guy that he knows. Steve Kerr is um, who worked for the Suns, who was the GM of the Suns, um, who worked for Server, was on the record in the story saying essentially uh, the same thing. And the Suns' two stars, Chris Paul and Devin Booker, um, you know, Chris Paul has been there for a little bit, obviously. Uh, Devin Booker has been with the organization a little bit longer. Um, both acknowledge the seriousness of the allegations, but are kind of waiting for uh, the investigation to, to the official investigation to kind of carry itself through before making any firm declarations either way. And I guess you can, if you put yourself in their shoes, you can understand where those players are coming from and Again, this isn't to attack them, but I guess like my um, my reaction is like this stuff has been rumored for years. Um, like in even just recently in 2019, Kevin Arnovitz, ESPN's Kevin Arnovitz, wrote a story about Phoenix, and it no. included uh, this famously funny story about uh, Sarver putting goats in then GM Ryan McDonough's office and then letting them defecate all over the floor. So it's not, I mean, that's not the same right. thing as being racist, but it is, um, it's just strange behavior, I suppose. And a lot of right. this is, and demeaning behavior. Uh, and that's what a lot of this is in, um, in the story. <sighs> can, and it just speaks just to his, say this? kind of his character. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to say this because I think this is important and it's not to say Steve Kerr doesn't get a say here. It's not to say Rex Chapman doesn't get a say here, but, and I, I don't doubt that some of these people were probably asked to speak up. Maybe they know him well enough to where they feel compelled to speak up on their own. Um, I, I, I just think when a story is about racism and, and misogyny that white men speaking up saying, that's not what I've seen. You, you're welcome to it. You have a right to do that. But if it comes across, which I think a lot of people do view it this way, as you sticking up for someone that other people have had really horrible experiences around, I'm not sure what it adds either. Mm-hmm. And I also don't know. You mentioned Ryan McDonough. Ryan McDonough gave a statement on 
Twitter a video that he posted. It was like three minutes long. Yeah, he didn't he didn't mention Sarver's name, didn't which I mean, I'm, I I know how I read that. Which if you're not coming to someone's defense, and you're saying that you feel horribly for the people involved, I mean, to me, I, and I don't know whether there's an axe to grind there because he obviously lost a job in, in Phoenix, but like it. If it's just, I don't know if these people are saying like that Sarver's not capable of doing it based on what we've heard and what we've read and the other stuff that we've heard and the other stuff that's been rumored. Is it really? I mean, it's not to say that he did it if he's capable of doing it, but like it's that's kind of what I was saying before at the top is like his judgment is not that of someone that like is is clear cut and and normal and like we know dude has the capability of like doing some pretty wild stuff saying some pretty wild stuff so i don't know i mean like more power to him if he can prove that it wasn't said this is why i'm saying that if 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 there's any proof out there if somebody's got the golden ticket with regard to like the stuff that brought down donald sterling now's the time to use it because it's, it's a pretty wild atmosphere there i have a whole lot of questions about stuff as it relates to basketball too with it um i mean the other thing you you mentioned that he really didn't deny anything except for one thing he did not comment at all on the stuff about the basketball stuff about him just walking in the locker rooms and like that was pretty jarring to me too that he wasn't even trying to deny that um (laughs) some of that stuff literally it had me laughing out loud when i was reading it's not a funny story but yeah. there's one anecdote in there about how he, he came into, I forget who was the head coach. Was it Watson? Maybe it was Watson. And just starts diagramming a, a play where there's a pick and roll in the paint. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, what is going on? Yeah, that was wild. Yeah. So it's just, it, it's that, I mean, and that's, again, that's the most lighthearted stuff in the story. The other stuff is dealing with, with sexism, is dealing with just weird, creepy sort of stuff and like this abundance of anecdotes about either saying the n-word or explaining to other people why he feels like he should be able to say it which is just like there's no place for that at this point in 2021 so i don't know i don't know what will come of it but it does strike me as different than sterling if if only for the tapes yeah i mean I i think this story definitely or not definitely but potentially needs a smoking gun and there is a quote in the story, I believe it's from a minority owner within the Suns organization, I could be getting that wrong, where he basically says, if the commissioner were to come in here and investigate, like he would be appalled. So I guess we'll see the results of that investigation in due time. Could be a while, I assume. Uh, I don't know how long Baxter worked on that story, but probably a long time, I would assume. Um, cause this guy's behavior has been rumored again for years as just being kind of off the wall and not great. And their culture has been, um, just really ugly for, as a basketball team, as an organization for years. So, um, you know, it's, it's like one of those things where it's great that there's going to be some action now, but. Like, you know, I think that a lot of people involved here, peripherally, people who have power and influence in the league, knew about this for years, and nothing happened. So that's that's when I say depressing at the top. That's really what I mean. Yeah. There's no other way to put it, really. And, and I think the depressing part of it is that we're going into it saying, with a, a, a report that explosive, that there may not be enough to change anything that to me is the depressing part whereas we're talking about uh, oh nba you know thank goodness we cover the nba not the nfl you and i are both in that boat where we don't watch the nfl um Mm -hmm. and i think probably feel pretty good about that in some ways because we don't um because the nba gets it right the nba does it better the nba cares more about these issues i've said this before the nba gets so much mileage out of their players being liberal relative to other leagues um because the owners you have a few of them that are liberal or lean left and are good on social issues you got a whole lot of owners that aren't and the ones that aren't um you just hope that they're not this ridiculous and that you know seemingly this bigoted this racist 
whatever you want to say, however you want to call it, however you want to phrase it. But that's just real. And I, I think that, you know, it, the, the league has been able to use their, their players as a cover for how they claim to feel politically. And they've gotten so much mileage out of that. And uh, it's it's a really good test for Adam Silver. We've talked about this before, too, that, you know, on some level it was perceived as a really strong move to get Donald Sterling out of the league. On some level, maybe it was. I think it was more that he benefited from that because there was so much evidence there. Um, and, you know, and that he could make that sort of thing happen. This is going to be a lot more difficult. So it'll be interesting to see what the investigation brings. Um and and how it's handled because I you know I think Silver's got he's got something to prove here. Um, this is a little bit more gray than the other stuff, even though it's not. I think you know what I mean by that. I do know what you mean. And if it's all right with you, I'd like to move on to talk about basketball. Is that is that okay, Chris? Are you excited to talk yeah, about basketball? I guess. Now? Yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um. So. There's a team that's been on my mind a little bit over the past few days, and it's the Philadelphia 76ers, who defeated the Detroit Pistons last night to make their record 7-2. And And the reason I've been thinking about them is, you know, there hasn't been a lot of conversation about this team that doesn't revolve around um, the fact that Ben Simmons is with the team but not playing and not mentally ready, whatever that means. Um, is his back okay? He's getting paid. He's not getting paid. He's getting paid. And it's just like a whole saga. And that seems to be really the, the through line narrative of that organization right now. But they also have the NBA's um, best offense, uh, the slowest pace, which I find to be really interesting because uh, Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, one of the big kind of um, fissures there was how uh, they had to play with pace because of Simmons, but Embiid is you know a low post center so the fact that so far it's early but so far they're the best offense and the slowest pace is really interesting uh Tobias Harris has missed the last two games due to health and safety protocols and you know Joel Embiid speaking of he looks really bad to start the year he's been awful He's been really bad. He's blamed the basket, the new basketballs. He's shooting forty one percent from the floor. He's averaging only twenty points a night. Um, there's a really shocking stat that might be the most shocking stat in the whole league or most unexpected. Right now, the Philadelphia 76ers are plus 38 with Embiid on the court. Um, Chris, do you want to guess what they are with Embiid off the court? More than plus 38? They are exactly plus 38. Yeah. So <laughs> anyone who has followed the NBA, even like, you know, tangentially over the past few seasons knows that when Joel Embiid isn't on the court, the Sixers stink. And when he plays, they're a contender. Exactly. So <laughs> so the fact that uh, Andre Drummond is just giving them ridiculously uh, effective minutes is kind of not like a super duper shock, but he's like their leader in on off efficiency or on off rating. And it's just it's just very wild. So my question to you, uh, Chris, is just like, what do you make of this team as they are currently constructed? Are they for real? What is sustainable here? What is make-believe? Are you surprised that they've been as as effective and successful as they've been without Simmons? Just what's your read on this team right now after nine games? Uh, I'll be real. A a little bit surprised, not completely. And I know this is one of the teams that um, I've been banging the drum about since I guess the first time I was really vocal about it was when you and I had the episode and I was like incredulous that they were not included on Christmas day. Um, because it's like, this is a team that was the number one seed Mm -hmm. last year. Um, that's roster didn't fundamentally change at that point had not changed really at all because Simmons was still on the roster. Um, I could have better understood it if Embiid was the one that was talking. I could have better understood them being excluded from Christmas if Embiid was the one that wanted out. Um, Because, you know, he's far and away their best player. Simmons is like a distant second. Uh, I guess you could have an argument that maybe Tobias is their, you know, their second best player, but I I probably wouldn't have argued that. Um, So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, Simmons, 
to me, didn't move the needle that much to exclude them from Christmas, like the, the not knowing where Simmons was going to end up. Um, and the truth was, you know, yeah, they, they certainly were not as good without Embiid on the court, and they were great with Simmons defensively, but to me, they had such a good defense, decent defense, that they could still kind of coexist without having Simmons there. They could still exist without having Simmons there. So I'm not totally surprised. Now, I wouldn't have thought that they'd have the best offense in the league. I, I wouldn't have thought that their record would be this good. I think the biggest thing I'm surprised by is I would not have expected them to be this good with Embiid playing this poorly. Uh, he's had nights where he's looked rough. And, I mean, did you Did you happen not. to watch? I'm, pu- I know, I'm putting you on the spot. Did you happen to watch last night's game against the Pistons? I, I did, and th- that was another one where really they, you know, it took them a while to really get some distance. Uh, they just did not, you know, and maybe a little bit more understandable with Harris not being there. But, you know, you're looking up, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of switching between the games, and I'm telling myself maybe I need to stick with this one a little bit more because every time I'd look up, the Pistons were, like, down by three or the Pistons were up by one. And you're thinking that that's a team that they could just put away. I mean, the Pistons have been – we talk about rough. I mean, the Pistons have been rough. And, and at least, thank goodness, they've got yep. Kate Cunningham back. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so the, the, the Sixers have been – the Sixers have had moments where they look pretty bad. But I think what's really carrying them through on some level is like everybody else other than Embiid. Their bench has been fantastic. Uh, Drummond, as you mentioned, I, I think – People went way overboard on the one side with Drummond last yeah. year. You know, even even I was obviously very critical of him, where I was basically asking like, "Does rebounding matter anymore?" Through the prism of <laughs> Andre Drummond, it, de- it definitely didn't matter enough to where he needed to be a max guy or anywhere near it. But when you take that same player and make him a minimum player, you feel a lot differently about his value. And when he flirts with triple doubles. You feel pretty good about having somebody like that on your roster when you're paying them a minimum. Um, so, I mean, he's he's had moments, and he's made passes that look fantastic. Obviously, they've gotten really good play out of Maxi. Shake Milton has looked good. And, and, you know, one of the things we have not talked about is we worried about Ben Simmons is how do the guys that fill his touches do and having more opportunities to handle the ball. Um, obviously, these are guys that have had reps and opportunities getting to handle the ball, but Cork Maz is a guy that – was not handling it as much, who's gotten more opportunities this year and has looked good, relatively speaking, in doing it. Um, but their bench, I mean, their bench lineups, Niang is another guy that has been fantastic for them so far and, and filling some of those minutes. And so not not necessarily as a ball handler, but just in terms of the bench rotation, they've, they've looked good. And uh, I'm kind of curious to see how far it goes. I don't think they can continue to play this well with Embiid sucking. Uh, that's a strong word to use, but like with him playing – at this level of capability, I think that he needs to do more, obviously. But um, I could still see them finishing top two or three in the East. I would maybe be a little bit surprised, but I was more surprised by everybody that like had them falling out of the top four. I didn't understand that, and um, I didn't think they lost enough to justify dropping them that far, even with all the drama swirling around them. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that you just said. Seth Curry also is just like – he's one Lights of the up. reasons why – I'm like dubious. Like he's obviously a great shooter, but his tr- he leads the league in effective uh, field goal percentage and true shooting by substantial margins. And I think the seven or eight players who are next in line in true shooting are all centers. And it's just like <laughs> I mean, this guy is just it doesn't really compute how accurate he's been. And when you shoot the ball. Just as I mean, this team doesn't isn't getting to the rim like at all this year. There's like Tyrese Maxey floaters, and that's basically how they're generating offense in the paint. Um, so when you're hitting your outside shots like they have, they should be winning, frankly, because um, they're pretty solid defensively. They're taking a little bit of a step back because obviously Simmons is Simmons, and sure. I think they're they're twelfth now in defensive rating. But like I expect the offense to come back to earth a little bit. And then I was looking at their schedule. Uh, uh, last been a little night. bit soft, and it's been soft. But this is the upcoming schedule. So they have uh, tomorrow. They are at Chicago, uh, and then they have a doubleheader: Knicks, Bucks, uh, Raptors. Following, uh, then they go to Indy. Then they're at Utah. Then they're at Denver. Then they're at Portland. 
Um, so that's like a that's not a good stretch for any. Like they could really, you know, there's a world where they lose like all those games. I guess I don't think they will, but those are all pretty good teams. Um, be a good test for them for sure. It, it'll be it'll be a good test if their shooting comes back to it. Just how are they gonna kind of hold up and gut through wins? You know, they played the the Pistons twice. I think um, the uh, their win against. Portland without Embiid or Harris was impressive, but then also, you know, this is a different conversation, but the Blazers are, uh, you know, kind of a mess right now, and Dame is one of the most disappointing players in the entire yeah. league, so it's kind of tough to really, like, get a read on this team. I, I understand your optimism and maybe a little bit of your regret for, like, not sticking to your guns with how how good you think that they could be this season after last season finishing first uh, in the East. But I'm still a little, like, we're only nine games in. The schedule, yeah. They're about to do this West, West Coast road trip that could get really messy. Embiid's already missed one game. His minutes are down. Um, and I don't know if that's, like, you know, I, he's got the knee issue. It's just, like, a th- whole thing with him every year. So when's he going to miss know. a week? When's he going to miss two weeks? It's going to happen. Um, but the next part of this that I want to bring up, because I can't help myself, uh, <laughs> I want to go back to Simmons for a second and ask you, do you think like Daryl Morey looks at this, the hot start, uh, the offense, and it like softens his resolute belief that he needs to trade Simmons for an all-star and that he would look at the roster look at how well they've played so far and say if we were to get um you know even like the D'Angelo Russell Malik Beasley package or if we were to get uh I can't even think Colin Sexton and Kevin Love that's probably not what he would be interested in but like Mm. just a combination of pretty good role players to add to what they have already just because they're getting nothing from a max salary slot. And right. Like, that's not acceptable. Right. And that's been my thing forever is I'm not thrilled at how Simmons has handled this, you know, while also trying to give full space and um, potentially um, an excuse and excusal, you know, on the idea if, if, if it's a mental health issue for him. I'm, you know, I want to be mindful of that. Um, but also saying to myself that, look, if you're Daryl Morey, it's a pretty privileged sort of feeling to think that sometimes you just don't have, sometimes you've got fissures that you can't work through in the timeline that you would like to work through it. You would love to have four more years to figure this out. And I know he's talked big on that and the idea that like, this is just going to be a stalemate. You don't have time to have stalemates when you're like a championship contender. Uh, with Joel Embiid as your your right. centerpiece, Joel Embiid has one injury. You can throw that out the window, and all of a sudden it's like you're you're tanking. Which some people would say maybe that's better anyway. At a certain point, if you don't quite have enough to win the whole thing, they could have enough to win the whole thing. It just means you need to get a damn good package for them. That doesn't mean Lillard or bust. I mean that's there's plenty of people that you could potentially trade him for. Um, I don't know what that looks like when, when he's been holding out this long and when he's hurting his value or where you're helping him hurt his value by holding out this long. So I don't know what they've targeted. I don't know how close they were on any of these deals, but there were plenty that I would have been willing to seriously pull the trigger for um, if any of them were realistic. Um, I, you're not getting back four picks for him. I mean, he's, you're just not. And um, if you could get back a pick for him and, and two really good players – that maybe are not all star level, but like are really good role guys that would fill your team and fit your team perfectly. And you're already winning close to 60% of your games as constructed without any of those guys. You're going to need depth. Again, you've got Joel Embiid on your team. So you're going to need depth. Uh, you're going to want other guys so that you don't just burn out the ones you have on the wings. Uh, you're going to want other guys that can handle the ball when, when Shake Milton still a relatively young player, starts to falter a little bit when Seth stops knocking down shots like he's his brother. You're going to want other guys. So I, to me, they should have had this done a long time ago, even if you couldn't even realistically get in a conversation for any of the guys, the superstars that you wanted to be in on, Beal, Lillard, whoever. So, yeah, I 
I would love to see them do that just because I, I think that they have a re- very real chance. Um, and I've thought that the whole time. Yeah, just like, oh man, like Simmons for CJ, just it. If I'm Portland now, I probably am like, even though Portland's kind of messed up right now, it's just like these these type of deals, just like they're fine. Just do them. You know what I mean? Like it's just, it's, I don't know. We'll see. I think they have to wait until, what is it, December 15th when everybody who signed a contract in the offseason is trade eligible or a ton of people who signed contracts are trade eligible. Uh, so hopefully a deal happens shortly after that deadline. But um, who knows? Like also Philadelphia, like if they really stumble on this West Coast road trip here and they have a really bad November, I wonder how that impacts everything. And maybe they're just like, as you were saying, maybe they're just like, all right, let's just kind of pack it in this year. Let's get <laughs> a top, try to get a top five pick, and which would be just wonderful after what they went through to get Embiid and Simmons in the first place. I'm sure their fan base would be super pumped about that plan of action. Um, that, that, that arena will burn if that happens. Please don't let it that probably happen. would literally burn to the ground. Okay, so let, let's let's move on to uh, an email from from Rob, who now this question is also this is about the Phoenix Suns. Rob wrote it before. Um, uh, a Baxter's story about Robert Sarver was published. So this is a strictly basketball question about Phoenix. Uh, Rob writes, Hey guys, I've been a Suns fan since the Berlin Wall was a thing. I've seen many players come and go. When Devin Booker arrived, I didn't think much of him. He has grown on me. He seems like a decent guy. He gives back to the community. He stuck around when I wouldn't have blamed him if he took a rocket ship out of the desert. When everything is said and done, he may be the greatest son ever. My issue, however, is that I don't think he is a superstar player. I don't think you'll win a championship with him as your best player. Many Suns fans always feel he is disrespected and does not get enough credit. I think he gets too much. I love that he is on my team, but I don't see what everybody else does. If I'm the other team, he doesn't scare me as much as Lillard does, for instance. Am I too low on Devin Booker, or is most of the Suns fan base too high on him? What do you guys think? Uh, thank you, Rob. That was a great question. I'm going to throw it to you, Chris. Uh, is Devin Booker overrated? Your your thoughts on this? Uh, I, I don't think we can call him overrated because I think – I mean, first of all, I think it's – it's a good question, but it's also framed through the prism of the Suns fan base, which I think every fan base probably overrates their own players a little bit. I think the flip side of that is that the rest of the media and other people, you know, just fans in general, probably underrate the players because they don't watch them as much as the the fans of that team do. They don't have the same investment that the fans of that team do. So there's pro- he's probably somewhere in the middle. I, I don't have him as a superstar. So to speak to me, and and I remember taking Flack, um, what was it, a week and a half ago? Maybe two weeks ago, I wrote a story, a a daily cover story about the Bulls. And I think the whole premise of my story was, can the Bulls basically take the next step and make, you know, make a jump into contention without a superstar, but they've got like three smaller stars in Vooch, DeRozan, Uh and Levine. And a lot of Bulls fans jumped in my mentions and said, how dare you? Levine is a superstar. And the way I view that is, no, you don't get to proclaim that you've got a superstar when your team has the worst record in the NBA over the last four years. You don't get to say that. He's a because one-time you, all-star. He's a one-time all-star. I mean, I get that he he still has the potential, I think, maybe to jump at the back end of that conversation as a superstar. Maybe. But I think that that happens when you start to win. And and Booker, God bless him, very very good player, maybe a great player. Um, had you know he was very close to making the playoffs on his own with without you know the Chris Paul being there. But even if he had done that, you you don't get to call yourself a superstar when you sneak into the playoffs by going seven and zero in the bubble or whatever it was. Uh, superstars will their team to the playoffs. I covered Carmelo for those years in New York where he wasn't making the playoffs. I would never have called Carmelo a superstar in that regard. Uh, I don't think you can miss the playoffs consistently. And granted, if you're, you know, 21, 22 year old and that's happening repeatedly, uh, you know, Booker is still very young. 
you, maybe you have a little bit more of an argument to say that he's going to be one, but he's just not one yet. Levine's older than that. So, I, you know, I wouldn't have him at, at superstar status now. I think he, his decision-making can still be off at times. Um, he's gotten better on defense. He's gotten better as a passer. He's still a, he's a devastating scorer, and I think you've got a number of those in the league that I would not call superstars, and I think Booker's probably on that list. Um, and the fact that he's got someone that's pretty much on his level – just a very, very different sort of player, but a more complete player than him. Um, I, I would say that that he's got someone on his team that's equally important as it relates to how they've gotten as far as they have in the last year. So I, I would say not quite, but I don't think that the Phoenix fan base is way off, and I don't think the people that say he's not a superstar are way off. I think it's somewhere in the middle. I think he has the potential to be one for sure. Yeah, he's 25 years old. Um he had two 40 point games in the NBA Finals, which is not something that a lot of people can say that they've ever done. Uh, his team was up 2 0 in the NBA Finals. They could have easily won the championship. He would have been the right. leading scorer on a champion, et cetera. I do, you know, I don't, I don't really want to get into the overrated, underrated with Devin. Like, I think he's a tremendous talent. Um, Superstar is like a there's like eight superstars right. to me. So like people talk like there's thirty of them, like one each team gets one, and that's not how it works. But it's just not. It isn't. Um if you look right now, now it's early. Booker is one of those guys who's off to a just career worst start to the season. He's not the only one. You know, I think a lot of a lot of scorers are struggling to adapt to a lot of things this year specifically how the refs are officiating the game. But, you know, Devin Booker's free throw rate is down. His true shooting is at a career low. Um, Phoenix's offense is worse when he's on the floor, which is just obviously, it's just not a good sign. Um, It's better when Chris Paul's on the floor. It's better than when Mikael Bridges and DeAndre Ayton are on the floor. Um, so, So, yeah, like I... Am I going to put him in the same category as a Dame right now? It's a little early for that, I would say. Um, not the Dame that we've seen this season, but just like the Dame we've seen yeah. that got him to be one of the top seventy-five players of all time. Um, I just, I, I don't think that like that's necessarily a fair comparison either, because like Devin Booker at twenty-five versus Dame at twenty-five, <laughs> like you're taking Devin Booker, I would say. Um, <laughs> But but yeah, it's it's an interesting. I guess it's just an interesting insight into a fan's um, mind here with this type of question from Rob. Where, like, I think a lot of teams would be thrilled. A lot of fan bases would be thrilled to have a player like Devin Booker on their team and to have drafted him with the thirteenth overall pick. I think it was and just um, have him be committed, have him perform well in a playoff run, go to the finals as the leading scorer. Uh, but like I, I, I will say like I do when Devin Booker has the ball in crunch time, like I'm fairly confident he'll make the right choice. I'm fairly confident when the ball leaves his fingertips on a pull up that it's gonna go in. Frankly, like he's earned that respect at least in my eyes. But sure. it is it is a it is a really interesting kind of lens here. And Rob, thank you again uh, so much for the email. Um, our next email comes in from Colin, who writes. Hey guys, as the resident Blazers fan of the Open Floor Globe, I have to ask a question about Anthony Simons. Overall, the Blazers have been pretty mediocre, but a huge bright spot has been Simons' play. He's added a lot to his scoring game this year, and I haven't heard many people talk about him. Could he be a sleeper for most improved player? Do you guys think his play is sustainable? Uh, thank you so much, Colin. So real quick, I, I just want to say, yes, I do think his play is sustainable. Um, I wrote a profile of Simons for SB Nation a couple of years ago, heading into the 2019-2020 uh, season, and the organization was just so high on him then. And, you know, I think they thought what he's doing now he was going to do then. So I, I think this is just like... You know, he's still extremely young. This is his fourth year. He came into the league as the youngest guy in the entire NBA. Um, and he just, he just looks terrific. He looks like he's made a leap, and I think that that is 
you know, based on what the expectations were for him when they had him and throughout his development, uh, he's just he's becoming what they thought he would be. So I, I'm 100 percent in on Anthony Simons. I love his play. But but this question kind of leads me to just ask, like, in addition to Simons, just who, who else kind of stands out to you as a potential most improved player candidate so far this season? It's obviously very early, Chris. But do, do any names kind of kind of percolate into your brain when I ask that question? Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, I think Simons is a perfectly fitting one. Um, I don't know if he's who I'd choose, but it's interesting because I kind of feel like a lot of times with my predictions, I'm like a year off. I thought Jokic would be MVP two years ago, and he won it last year. Um, I know that the for the Blazers, where they sit, I'm sure they're thrilled now that he's playing the way he is now. But given how little help they've had, from anybody not named um, Dame, CJ, or Nurk, you know, they would have welcomed this sooner. And I think that there were people projecting like a third year leap from Simons a year ago. And so, um, so he, he's certainly one that I think makes sense. I, my first thought is Harrison Barnes. He's been fantastic this year. He has been so good at game winners. He's doing all the solid stuff that he's always done. I think more likely, and it depends on where you sit as far as uh, I'm, I'm not a big believer in giving second and even sometimes third year guys most improved player. Um, Luca was getting votes last year, which I thought was weird. Um, I, I don't think people that are that young should be getting votes for an award like that when they're you know they, they they're just getting their they're just able to start drinking legally. I don't think that they need to be getting most improved votes. Um, but if you are of that flavor and of that feeling, I think Ja Morant has to be at the top of that conversation so far, um, just statistically. I, I just think he has to be. He's up almost, what, 10 games, ten points per game from what he was before, shooting on much better efficiency. You, you kind of felt like there was going to be a possibility of him making a leap like that. He was he had a down year last year statistically as far as efficiency was concerned. So I think he's one, and I think Miles Bridges is the other one that um, needs to be your need at or near the top of that list as well as far as guys that uh, look the part, a guy that is on a team that, that looks like it'll be fun and looks like it'll be in the media spotlight a little bit more as well. So those are the names that come to mind for me. So uh, those are all great names, agreed. Uh, Miles Bridges is an obvious candidate here, I think also uh, been tremendous in Charlotte. My guy, um, DeJounte Murray, uh, can I read yes. you some stats? Uh, Please. He's been sh- fantastic, too. Go ahead. I, I, I just, I love, whenever you write a profile about a player, I don't know if you feel the same <laughs> way, Chris, but, like, you're just, you kind of just, like, root for them, because, like, I, I I don't know how you, you what, what your mindset is whenever you write a feature or a profile about someone or, or a team, but, like, usually I'm trying to, like, be be kind of positive and and projected forward in a positive light so like i think they're going to be good and that's why i want to kind of go under the hood here and so when it actually happens you're just like yes this confirmation is bias true. you want you want them to confirm what you were thinking and what you were projecting 100%. god I've, and you're making me you're giving me nightmares about the ones i've been wrong about i had a headline about <laughs> i had a headline about gary harris and how he was the next Kawhi, and it was basically based on their statistics oh. being the same way through like the first five years of their career and how they started is like these guys that only defended and then kind of blossomed into these offensive players that were really good and it's like yeah that didn't work that didn't happen so when i, I, I got when off I that see, train I, I see gary harris when i watch the magic every time i forget that gary harris is on the magic he was like, that dude he had a chance to be that dude i mean yeah and if he and if he had been I mean, not like MVP that dude, which he had a teammate that was, but like if he had blossomed to anything close to what we thought, and he obviously injuries were a big part of that, but also even once he was healthy, just never was the same player anymore. Um, the Nuggets could have been a contender sooner than they were. They they would still have him on the roster, presumably, if, if he was that guy. And even without Jamal Murray, I think they could have potentially been a – I mean, some people think they're contenders now, as is, even if Murray's not back right away. Um, I mean, so they were hoping and wishing that he could just restore himself into that guy, and it just wasn't to be. But, uh, yeah, I've been wrong on that, but I know what you mean about kind of rooting a little bit just to, you know, to hope that you're right in what you've written, the lofty stuff you've written about certain people. All right, so this is my 
uh, my my chance to, to to brag a little bit about my guy Dejante. So, um, here are his stats compared to uh, James Harden so far this season. And I know James is having uh, a down year, but it's still James Harden. I don't care what anyone says. Um, both averaging exactly eighteen point three points per game. Harden's averaging 8.9 assists to Murray's 8.4 assists. Wow. Uh, Harden's averaging 7.1 rebounds to Murray's 7.8 rebounds. I just like those are, I know those are basic numbers, but like 18, 8, and 7, I don't know how many guys in the league are doing it. That's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, Murray is shooting 35.3% behind the three point line. Um, on 4.3 attempts, which is obviously a humongous um, boost for him. Now, Harden is at 39.7 on 7.9 attempts. But when you look at their um, their their PERs, De- DeJounte De- Murray's PER is 20.5. Harden's is 19.6. Their usage is similar. Harden's turnover rate is over twice as high. Uh, Murray has a slightly better win shares per 48. So... I just think that that's really interesting, and I know a lot of it is about hard and struggle. I'm not like blind and stupid, but uh, if you've watched the Spurs, Murray is just such a beast out there. He just does everything. He's so unique. Um, the defense is still there from when he was on the youngest player ever named to an all defensive team. Uh, just like a magical experience watching him play basketball. Frankly, I love it so much. He's the reason why you should watch the Spurs if you have just like slept on the Spurs. Um, so shout out to him. That's that's another. That's just a guy who I've had kind of on my mind there. Um, okay, so let's let's jump to uh, this last email from Gaddis, who writes: Is it possible? that the most overrated and underrated players currently come from the same team. Desmond Bain is an absolute elite shooter. Meanwhile, Jaron Jackson Jr. still can't average more than five rebounds per game while struggling to shoot from three on high volume for the second year in a row. He has not been the same since suffering his injuries. What are your thoughts? Uh, Hmm. So (laughs) no shots at anybody. Uh, Desmond Bain is, is incredible. He's been terrific and really kind of validates them trading Grayson Allen frankly like Desmond Bain's just yeah. better and you're giving him you're giving a better player minutes so that move being criticized should not be criticized anymore and I don't know if you saw um the Grizzlies win against the Nuggets the other night Chris but this email came in before that game and Jaron Jackson Jr. was an absolute monster in that game I know it's only <laughs> one game but he uh, was, you know, guarding Jokic in crunch time, holding him up in the post on the game's final possession, and uh, you know, hitting spot threes, hitting trailer threes, rebounding the ball actually in traffic, big rebounds, um, big defensive plays. He's got a long way to go, I think, but I, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't really view him as being that overrated. I might be wrong there, like. I see that contract, and if that contract was on my cap sheet as an owner or a GM, I'd be like, cool. I'm happy about this. I'm fine. I'm glad we have this player. He's going to be useful. Um, Real quick, what are your thoughts about those two before we kind of expand on this question? No, I think Bain is an interesting pick, uh, and I think both of them are. It kind of gets back to the way a fan base, I think, in particular views a guy, uh, the way that they might view it differently. I think that uh, Jaron Jackson's been a kind of people that think the way you and me do has kind of been a darling of of kind of that that segment of Twitter and and just basketball heads in general. So he has underperformed this year. There's no way around it. He has looked kind of rough since he's been back from injury. There's no way around it. I don't think he'd be my most overrated guy. Um, this is going to be rough, and this is probably like I, – if I'm sifting through every single guy in the league, this isn't probably the guy I'm picking, but I do think he's overrated, and I think that the afterglow of a championship really does it too. Uh, I want to see Bobby Portis kind of prove it for another season, uh, and that's without even knowing off the top of my head what he makes. Um, but, I mean, that, that fan base loves him, and they're welcome to love him, and they will love him presumably for the rest of his life because of the championship alone. But, I mean, there was a reason that he was 
available to them when he was. Um, and just looking at it so far, and I know he, he was injured to start the year. You know, it, the numbers, there, there's a very good chance the numbers come back down to earth a little bit for him this season. And uh, so I'm kind of curious to see whether that happens. He's never been a great great defender but plays with a team that has good defense around him and so you know he's a guy that i think just as far as like literally someone being chanted you know bobby bobby and the whole mayor thing um that 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 might be like that might be like a once in a career sort of reception that he gets there um so we'll we'll, we'll see i'm curious to see where it goes i'm curious to see whether it continues but he's who i think of as is at least one of the most overrated guys as it relates to like just how loved that dude is and i think you know to the point that it probably made other fan bases say like man we gave up on that dude and you know mm. i i think it was it might have been okay to give up on him i think he was just a really good fit for last year's roster yeah he's only played in three games this season the living legend bobby portis uh that, i mean this 10. man got to speak after after the title like they handed the mic to this man <laughs> malika andrews <laughs> handed the mic to this man incredible like i'm still kind of that that's how unreal last year was yeah it, it was surreal uh, I, I mean yeah i still can't believe any of it happened frankly um <laughs> nor can i believe that he signed the contract that he did which yeah is like more in line with Typical, like what he would have gotten if he had a typical Bobby Portis season, not become a folk hero and shot like 49% from behind the three point line and like willed the Bucks to a critical win in the Eastern Conference Finals single handedly. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like, that's still hard to believe, but he I, shout out to him for, for doing that too because you know, I, I thought he was super gone and I remember think I think I said during one of our podcasts. It's going to be hard to walk away from Milwaukee with the sort of love they're showing him where he you know, probably can walk into any restaurant for years and be taken care of if, if he doesn't have his wallet. Uh, it's hard to walk away from places like that. But I think when you're younger, and I don't know exactly how old. Let's see. How old is Bobby Portis? Bobby Portis. This, so last year was this, this year's his 26-year-old season. Um, so he's not like super, super young, but he's not so far into his career. That would be 26 in two seconds. In terms of... In terms of uh, in why you life. would stick around? No, in my life, I would like to be 26 again. That would be nice. Oh, I so. hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. I, I, would mean, like to be, but, I would like to be as old as Chris Herring, in other words, for a long time. Listeners wow. Understand that. <laughs> Are we still doing this? I thought we were friends. Uh, literally um, for the rest of your life. <laughs> Someone else DM'd me, too. And they. I think I tweeted about how I was like, man, I was like watching one Saturday morning at that age. Like I was watching the Disney cartoons. <laughs> on channel seven and they're like one saturday morning started the year after american gladiator went off the air i was like man (laughs) salty and i was like someone actually pulled up the research and they like hit me with facts so i did not watch american gladiator but i did not know so many other people did um anyway yeah bobby portis though i think that he like i said he's probably not the most overrated guy in the league but relative to what he is uh and he's not even paid like you know like the most overrated guy in the league. I just think that with what last year was, like that's probably not who he is for the rest of his career outside of that one season. I don't ever see that happening again. If it does, then he's going to be in a totally different stratosphere. He's not going to be able to play with Milwaukee for much longer because it's just, I mean, he's going to be out at their pay grade. I asked you in our outline to come up with like a couple underrated players, a couple overrated players, and I honestly had a difficult time coming up with like overrated players. There aren't that like, many. That seems like it's in line, right? Yeah, and and you know, there's a lot of different ways you can look at this. You can be very online and just look at the reactions that NBA Twitter has, which is just a totally healthy way to formulate opinions on things. Um, you can obviously look at how much money they make. That's another way to to view it. Um, the one there's one name I mean like before he went before he uh kind of self combusted um in the playoffs last year, like Ben Simmons was my go to for this type of question. But mm-hmm. I don't I don't think he's overrated now because like I feel like consensus has kind of come back to maybe where I was throughout the past few years leading into that that postseason run and like when they let go of Jimmy Butler that season, I was just like, okay, that was a mistake because Jimmy Butler should have been the player that you keep there. 
um, not Ben Simmons. But anyway, the player who kind of really comes to mind here for me, and I appreciate everything that he does. I appreciate the season that he had last year. I appreciate his age and how young he is and how much time there is for him to grow. But it's still Michael Porter Jr., I think, for me. I think I was really that's... close to saying that too, and I was like, uh, "It's om- not that it was obvious because it's not." But I'm I'm trying to give him a little bit more time to turn it around this season, just a little bit. I mean, but he's not this complete season's... anyway. This season's been uh, really bad, bad. Yep. really bad. Um, and I mean, he hasn't hit. Let's see here. Uh, he is 0 for 12 in his last three games, 1 for 18 in his last four games from behind Ooh. the three-point line. And this is a guy who, when he catches fire, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, he's huge, high release, is perfectly fine with a hand in his face. He's one just one of those guys who just goes unconscious, and that's part of the reason, if not all of the reason why, including like he's super athletic, but why he got a max deal that is not fully guaranteed, but pretty close. And it's a lot of money, we'll say. A lot of money for a team team that's a contender. For a team that's a contender that didn't necessarily need to extend him before, um, especially if you're going to give that money, like, now that I'm thinking about this, you could have just waited for this season and then maybe... Maybe they they uh, they paid him too early. I don't know. We'll see. It's early in the year. If this keeps up, I don't know how many teams are going to be giving him a max deal, though. We'll see. Anyway, um, when I watch the Denver Nuggets play, he's just not involved in the offense as much as you would expect him to be, uh, particularly without Jamal Murray. I mean, like, I'm not thinking or expecting him to be like a secondary ball handler or anything like that. That's just not who he is. But... I'm also not expecting like Will Barton to be kind of the guy who's in crunch time running the pick and roll with Jokic um, and everybody else is standing around. You know what I mean? And you throw out like you include the defense, which it just it's it's still so bad. Like I don't I don't know what people are watching when they say, oh, his defense is better and then they leave it there. Because its defense, like, is so it's so bad, and yeah, there's only moments where it's, it looks better, where he comes from behind with a block, but it's not consistent, right? And if you watch the games, um, you know his teammates are constant. His teammates and his coaches are are constantly on him. And I wrote a piece about this last year with a ton of footage, all these clips of just frustration <laughs> from teammates and coaches. Piece. And honestly, I have an I you know I keep a notebook when I'm watching games now, and I always have. And in it, I could write the same column this year. There's plenty of examples. Yeah. So I don't know if he's improving on that end. I don't know how the money is going to impact him. You don't want to like speculate about stuff like that, but who knows? Uh, and who knows physically how he's going to hold up? Obviously, there's there's been question marks and red flags and et cetera, et cetera, about his body. But I don't know, like, I, I just wouldn't feel super great about paying him that much money if I were the, the GM of What's... the Denver Nuggets, who is very smart and knows what he's doing and has, way, has forgotten more about basketball than I've ever known. But What's... that's just how I would What's feel. What's the worst case scenario there? Is it, like, I'm thinking in my head, like, is it, it's way too early, but is it, like, Otto Porter Wizards sort of scenario where you max out oh somebody God. for their shooting ability, but they don't create a whole lot? for other people and then they're hurt like i mean that would be pretty bad because we thought we thought off of one of those they had like one really decent playoff run right where we're just watching Otto porter and his progression and we're watching beal and we're watching wall and we're thinking that there's ability to contend for like the next few years particularly if porter takes a jump and then not only does it not come or are you it's a chicken in the egg maybe it doesn't come because he's not consistently on the court enough or maybe it just doesn't come because it wasn't going to come. Um, but to me, that's my fear, except for the fact that Michael Porter already had injury concerns. There's a whole reason he slid in the draft to begin with and that Denver was able to get him to begin with. So, I mean, it's early. Uh, and you don't want to just bring up injury just because it's convenient to bring it up. But, yeah, this was my concern. And I think when I wrote my piece um, to start the season about like the seven biggest X factors – he was actually the guy I led the piece with. 
not because I didn't have ability and, you know, I figured he'd be better than this. Hell, I, I figure, you know, Ish Smith will be better than this. I love Ish Smith, by the way. Um, a lot of people will be better than this. But it was more that I think to your overrated, underrated question initially, I thought a lot of people were starting to put the cart before the horse with him because I think they see how many points per game he averages and how good a shooter he is and assume that he has a bigger role in their offense than he does. And I'm sitting there watching Will Barton kind of bust his hump fresh off his injuries for the last couple of years without Jamal Murray there. I don't love that. Like I love that he's handling the ball and getting back into the rhythm of the offense and getting his feet wet again. But you would love for Michael Porter to be able to do some of that. He doesn't have to do a lot of it, but some of it. And if not, you're just relying on his shooting constantly. And it's I don't know. Maybe it's sustainable. He's done it for a couple of years now. But um, you want to see him grow a little bit at his age and just with how much money you just threw this man. And it's a little bit disheartening to see that um, if he can't shoot or if he has a cold stretch, he's just not helping you. Yeah, his um, – his usage is the same as Jeff Green's right now. So, you know, that's not that's not super super great. Um and you know, I should say I know I'm, I'm crapping on the defense. I I know that the on-offs are very great for him and Denver's defense in general has been one of the league's best so far, but if you, I'm I'm just telling you like the numbers are the numbers and sure in some cases numbers don't lie, but Right now, I think you should you should watch the Denver Nuggets if you don't, and you think that he's improving dramatically on defense. I just I don't see it um, as consistently. I don't see consistent improvement from him. I see a lot of mistakes. So, um, great. Well, that's just a wonderful note to end today's episode, uh, Chris. Did you give uh, your most <laughs> underrated men? Oh, my most underrated. We didn't do that I yet. So- no, I have – well, you know, honestly, in putting this list together, I have a lot of guys who we've just mentioned throughout the episode. Like, I think DeJounte is underrated. I think Seth Curry True. is underrated. Okay. Um, I think Will Barton's underrated. Uh, I think Spencer Dinwiddie is someone um, we discussed at length when we were putting together the top 100. I think he's underrated, and he's – He's not getting to the free throw line as much as he probably will eventually. And I think, you know, free throw rate is down for everybody. Um, and that's a huge part of why I like his game. So, you know, if that does not come back, then I kind of take back a lot of what I say. But he's been playing pretty well for Washington, and Washington looks great. Um, I think, I don't know if I can say that uh, Cole Anthony is underrated. But nice season he's had so far, though, right? He, I did. I honestly never. I mean, I, I, not to say I never expected this from him, but did not expect it this far, this soon, with the players who are around him. Um, he's I just enjoy watching terrific. Orlando a lot. I really have so far. I mean, a number of guys over there are just having really nice seasons. That mm-hmm. you didn't want to say you were willing to throw people away after a rookie year necessarily. It's kind of embarrassing to say that as a basketball analyst, given what we know about how young these guys are. But Cole had a rough, I mean, a really rough year. Um, And so not only is it really nice to see him, but even uh, Bamba has been really nice. And, and, you know, I'm not super big on on Mo Wagner, but Franz, you know, I watched most of his games. One of the few people I can say I watched basically all of his games in college because, I mean, you can see me wearing my Michigan shirt right now. Um, He's showing more – he's he's showing more than he did in Michigan offensively, which is really nice to see. Um, So you kind of threw out your guys that you would say are underrated. You know how I feel Um, from summer when we did our top 100. uh, Mm -hmm. I let a teammate of ours that shall not be named talk me out of it. I guess he kind of does this a lot. Uh, I've been bigger on higher on RJ Barrett for at least the last year at this point. And, um, you know, you can talk about some of the inconsistencies and some of the things you haven't seen out of Julius Randle, which it feels a little bit harsh to nitpick him too much since he's in the running for a triple-double pretty much every game now, like Russ style. Um, mm-hmm. But RJ, in a lot of ways, has kind of been their most consistent offensive player, certainly kind of scoring-wise. Uh, doesn't mean he's been their best scorer, but he, you could argue that he's been their most consistent one just from game to game over the last five, six games. Um you know, and doing it on better efficiency, which is what you want to see from him 
involved a lot more in transition, uh, going to his right hand a lot more, which was something that we didn't see much at all in his first year, and we're only seeing in, in dribs and drabs last year. But he's also kind of developing into the second half, like, killer, really, uh, where he's just, you know, his first halves are a little bit sluggish. I think that's really his next step. I've been saying that is just the ability to be more consistent from one half to the next and not showing up late. But, man, he he's really shown up when he shows up late. So uh, he's been a really nice player. I don't know. I don't know. Again, I don't know how I feel about the underrated players that are third-year guys or the guys that are most improved players in their third year. Mm-hmm. But yeah. um, he's 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 having a really, really nice season for them in a year where Kemba's kind of been hit or miss and kind of still finding his way. Rose has been finding his way a little bit this year. Randall has been turning it over a little bit more than I would like and has not been there in all the big moments uh, in the way that Barrett really has been for them. Yeah. And RJ defense. Looks, yeah. No, 100%. And he looks great. You're right. Our colleague who shall not be named until I out him shortly at some point, maybe on Twitter, maybe in our next episode. I don't know. Um, maybe we'll invite him on. Well, I, maybe I just added him. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> i um, live two anyway. blocks from him so i'm gonna get it worse than you will oh <laughs> uh, yes wonderful um anyway uh, uh i think that'll do it for today's show thanks again for everyone for sending all those emails in openfloormail at gmail.com that's openfloormail at gmail.com um everybody uh please stay safe everybody please continue to enjoy the nba season Whoa.